In this exercise, we are going to find the distance from the point one, two, three to the plane three X minus Y plus five Z equals two. Now there might be some formula out there that says, oh, if you know this point in this plane, plug into this and you'll get the distance that you're looking for. But I don't wanna memorize every single variant of, of the distance formula for all these different cases that you could have. Instead, I would like to show you how to create a diagram for this situation and then use geometry to figure out this distance because I think if you can do that, then you could solve similar problems. For example, find the distance from a point to a line or from a line to the plane. So if you can diagram your situation, it gives you a lot more problem solving abilities, particularly if you just don't know, you know the formula in question. The less memorizing I have to do, usually the happier I am. Okay, so let's say the point one, two, three is here. I'm just gonna drop it right there. I don't know exactly how the plane is situated relative to this point. I don't wanna waste any time figuring out its tilt. So just draw a representative plane. So this is three X minus Y plus five Z equals two. This picture might not be accurate, but it's completely usable for what we need. In particular, what we hope to find is the length of this line segment where I'm trying to, to draw this so that we drop straight down from P to the plane in a way which is perpendicular to the plane. So the length of this line segment is the perpendicular distance from this point to this plane. All right, if I happen to know this point where this line segment is intersecting the plane, then I would basically be done because I could use the distance formula, the, the classic one, to compute the length of this line segment. But we don't know that. So here's, I think, the next step. And that is to say, I don't know this point. Let me find any other point on the plane. So I'm going to say that this is some point which we'll call Q. And I can give Q coordinates. There are infinitely many ways to do that. You just need to find a triple of values, X, Y, and Z, that makes this plane equation true. So any pairing of x, y, and z coordinates that when you plug it into 3x minus y plus 5z, you get 2, is a point that lives on the plane. I think the easiest thing to do is zero out a couple coordinates. So let me say, you know, let x be 0, z be 0. So if I got rid of this and I got rid of this, I would be looking at negative y equals 2. So y is negative 2. Take a moment to check that this point I just identified does indeed live on the plane. And just for practice, identify two or three other points on the plane, which we could equally use in this computation. Hopefully in that pause, you concluded that yes, this point Q really does live on this plane. Here are some other options. I could zero out Y and Z and say, let's use the point two thirds, zero, zero or zero, zero, two fifths. Those are two other options where I've zeroed out two coordinates. Or you could do something different like one, one, six. So three plus five minus six is two. Yes, that's right. So you just need to find triple of values X, Y, and Z that makes this equation true and you found a point that lives on the plane. Any of them will work for this computation. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is connect Q to P with a vector actually. So let me sketch the vector like this, call this vector V, the vector from Q to P. So we can write down in coordinates what V is. It's going to be one minus zero. I'll write that out, one minus zero. Two minus negative two. Three minus zero. So that is the vector one, four, three. Whenever you're computing a distance computation with geometry, it's really great when you see something like a right triangle start to emerge. So if you look here, we have what looks like the leg of a right triangle, the hypotenuse of a right triangle down here. This would be the other leg of the right triangle. With vector computations, we won't actually need this leg. We don't really need the triangular structure to proceed, but it's always something that you want to see whenever you diagram this kind of situation. What we're going to do with vectors, though, is take this vector here and project it onto the sense of direction going from this point up to P. 
said that kind of strangely, so let me say what I mean. This line segment is part of a longer line. If I could project the vector v onto this line, the result would be, let me make it a different color. How about, I think I'm out of unique colors. Okay, I'll just grab this one. Let me do like a dash vector to the side. I hope that's not a mistake. This vector right here is the projection of v onto this line. It's called the line L. This would be the projection of V onto the line L. Projecting V onto L is equivalent to projecting V onto any vector parallel to L. It's all about projecting onto a sense of direction. So if I had a vector orthogonal to this plane, the vector projection of V onto L is equivalent to the vector projection of V onto this orthogonal vector I just sketched. Let me call this N. We have such a vector. In fact, we get it immediately from the problem. So the vector n, a vector known to be perpendicular to our plane, is the vector 3, negative 1, 5. comes right from the equation of the plane. OK, so this projection of v onto l is the same thing as the projection of v onto n. Let me call this. Um, I'll just call it the vector projection. How about that? So just to reiterate what I've been saying. Projecting V onto the line is the same thing as projecting V onto this orthogonal vector. The vector projection formula is something that you want to have memorized because this is a tool that you would use over and over in these kinds of vector computations. So while I don't want to memorize like all of the different ways to have points, lines, and planes in space and measuring distances between them, vector projection is a useful tool. OK, the projection of v onto n is v dot n divided by n dot n times the vector n. This gives you the vector projection. It would give you literally this vector that I sketched, this kind of dashed vector here. But I'm actually going to take a little bit of a shortcut where instead of solving for that entire vector and then computing its length, which is fine, you would get to the right answer that way, there's a little bit of a shortcut. OK, so let me just reiterate that option one is to literally do this projection as I've written it here. That gives you a vector. Then compute the length of that vector, and you've got your distance. But there's a shortcut. And that's to realize that n dot n is the length of n squared. Sometimes vector projection is written that way, so that's not really the shortcut itself. Let me keep going. Instead of saying v dot n divided by the length of n squared times the vector n, I'm going to take the vector n, divide it by its, its own magnitude. So I'm going to scoot one of these magnitudes over. So now we've got this expression. It's still the same formula. I've just reorganized it. The reason why this is a shortcut is because this is a unit length vector. So the length of this expression, which is the length we need, the length of this is the length of this. The length of this is equivalent to uh, the absolute value of the scalar. So I've got a scalar times a unit vector. So the length of that product comes from this leading term. So all we need to do is dot v and n, take the absolute value. If it's negative, then divide by the length of n. Let me give you a moment to digest this. If you haven't seen this presentation this way, you can write it down, finish this problem with me. You can also go back to the original projection, do it that first way I mentioned. So I'll step away for a moment, and then I will come back and finish this computation. In the interest of space, let me keep going to the right. What is the dot product of v and n? It's going to be 3 minus 4 plus 15. And we're going to divide that by the length of n, which is going to be the square root of 9 plus 1 plus 25.
Okay, this was this coefficient here. So let me write times the vector n divided by its own length, which I can actually go ahead and say is the square root of 35. This is the vector here whose length we need. And then what is that length? It's the size of this leading scalar. So to finish the problem, let me erase this comment here just to make sure I have enough room. All right, so our distance is the length of this projection which is the, the size, the absolute value of the scalar. So we have negative one plus 15 is going to be 14 over the square root of 35. Now we found the distance from that point to the plane. We were able to do that by not memorizing the formula for the distance from a point to a plane. That's not what I would ever encourage anyone to do. Rather, we created a diagram of the situation. All you need in order to proceed geometrically is just the idea of a point and a plane. From that picture, you start looking for things like line segments, maybe parts of a right triangle. That always gives you a feeling like you're measuring distance. Once we brought in this vector here, then we were able to recognize that, hey, the shadow of that onto the perpendicular line, in other words, the vector projection, that would produce a vector whose length is what we're looking for. So the only formula, if you will, that we needed to have memorized was that of vector projection. This component that we identified at the end, by the way, is sometimes called the scalar projection. It's how long the vector projection is. You don't have to memorize the scalar projection on its own, though, if you feel comfortable reproducing the step that I did here. And again, going back to the first version of this computation that I wrote down, you could also just find the vector projection. So finish out this computation, finding this vector, and then use the magnitude of that vector in order to say what the distance from the point to the plane is.